How many know that familiarity breeds contempt? Familiarity breeds contempt. Let me, let me expound on that just a little bit before I get started. That's like Pastor Sean. Everybody loves Pastor Sean, right? Yeah. Pastor, we honor you, we love you, but listen, when you're around him every single day, and you have to work with every single day, sometimes you don't always appreciate the gift that's within him. Um, I've got some guys that, that come to our meetings, and I work with different people in, in discipleship, and they work with me too. And it's real hard to work with somebody and be able to appreciate the gift on the inside of them when you're in a different environment. we got to change hats. We change hats, right? Sometimes I'm dad. Sometimes I'm a husband. Sometimes I'm a preacher. Sometimes I'm a teacher. Sometimes I'm working. Everybody loves that, right? We love working. So, so what happens <clears throat> when we spend 30 years in the church or 30 years teaching people and we spend so much time in church, in the Word of God, preaching, teaching, helping people, serving in the church, and, and then we get complacent? I'm going to talk about that today. Let's go to, I think you guys got the scripture, 1 Chronicles. I'm going to start in 1 Chronicles chapter 13. Y'all just, there it is. <laughs> Verse 6. And David went up in all of Israel to Be Bela, that is in Kajertham. I can't pronounce these words, so y'all just have to deal with me. <laughs> Which belonged to Judah to bring up thence the ark of God, the Lord, that dwelleth between the cherubims, whose name is called on it. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadad, and Uzzah and Ohio drave the cart, and David and all Israel played before with all their might, and with singing and harps, and with psalteries, and with timbrels, and with cymbals, and with trumpets. And when they came unto the threshing floor of Sidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him, because he put his hands to the ark, and there died before God. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask you to help me to help me to get out of the way so that you can bring forth the message you have for your children today. Father, we thank you for your word that it is true and never ending, never failing. Father, we thank you in Jesus Christ's name I pray. And everybody said? Amen. All right. So getting into this, I want to talk about Uzzah. How many have ever heard the name Uzzah? Not too many, right? Not too many. He was a priest. And he was consecrated before God to take care of the ark of God. So the ark wasn't in the city. It was not in Jerusalem. When it was brought back from the Philistines, it was stored in Uzzah's house and his brothers. He was uh, consecrated in order to take care of the ark of the covenant. And he took care of it for 30 years. So you might think that God's punishment towards Uzzah for touching the ark of God might have been a little bit extreme. How many feel that that was a little bit extreme? A little bit? Just a little bit? Could you imagine if you walked up and touched the Bible and God killed you? So it, it sounds like it was a little bit extreme, doesn't it? But Uzzah had been in the presence of God because, see, the Ark of, covenant, of the Covenant represented the presence of God. Wherever the Ark was, the presence of God was. This is Old Covenant, not New Covenant. See, the Spirit of God did not dwell within man at that time. It dwelled in the Ark of the Covenant. So wherever the Ark was, the presence of God was. So Uzzah had spent 30 years in the presence of God. So Uzzah had an understanding, and he knew the laws of God, right? So Uzzah knew that they were not supposed to touch 
the holy ark of God. The, the penalty for touching the ark was death. But you say, but Uzzah was trying to help and he didn't want it to fall. And, but listen, do you think God needs your help? Could you imagine when people saw Uzzah walking down the street, they said, oh, there goes the guy that saved God. Is God a man that he can lie? He said, if you touch a holy thing, you will die. That was his commandment. God is not a man that he can lie, so he could not go back on his promise or on his word, right? Now, Uzzah knew that it was wrong, but let me tell you, he was also wrong on another point. The ark of God was never to be transported on a new cart with oxen. The ark of God was made in commandment. God gave them a commandment to transport the ark. The Levites, the priestly tribe, were to be consecrated, and they carried poles. They carried the ark up on poles, and they would carry the ark on their shoulders, right? So what's the difference? Now, don't get me wrong. It makes sense to me. I mean, I can see Uzzah's logic, you know. Well, we got to go 30 miles, so, you know, carrying it on somebody's backs, that might get a little heavy. Come on, man. It'll take all day. So he was trying to help God, right? He said, oh, let's get an oxen cart. Put it on an oxen cart. But there's a problem with that because it's impersonal. It's impersonal. Sometimes you spend so much time in church and so much time doing church that you forget to reverence. We don't reverence the presence of God. We get so accustomed and so taken for granted that you don't realize how blessed you are to be in the presence of Almighty God. So we take it for granted and we got to kind of get complacent in our walk with God and we don't reverence the mighty presence of God. We have so much freedom in God that we take it for granted. So we end up taking shortcuts because we try to help God, right? Like God needs my help. Oh, y'all can act holy if you want because I've done it. I've done it myself. I know you're all holier than that, but I've done it. I tried to help. I know she needs this right now, Lord. And she better quit. If she don't quit, she's going to die. Y'all ain't never done that. I know, but I did. I thought I knew better than God. I thought I, thought I knew what I needed more than what God thought. I thought I was better than God. I was stronger than God. Right? Oh, God don't know what I need. I got this. Fell right on my face, too. God showed me. Praise God we don't live under the old covenant, because I'd have been dead. I'd have been like Uzzah. He's laying out. What happened to Steve? Oh, he touched God. But we, we don't reverence God enough. Our church culture today does not reverence the presence of God at all. You, in the old covenant, you didn't come before God in just any old way. If you want to come before a king, you're just going to strut in like you all that. What's up, man? That king would chop your head off so fast, you wouldn't have time to get through the door. But when you humble yourself and reverence that king, he'll raise his scepter so that you can come forward, right? That's what God wants from us. He's our friend. He's our father. We have a far better covenant right now, and the Holy Spirit resides within us, and we take it for granted. We have taken the presence of God for granted. We have taken the authority of God for granted. Some of us have been in the presence so long we think that we can manage and control the presence of God. Right? We, th we, we so smart. <laughs> right? We think we can manage. Okay, we got... Um, uh, Three songs, too, too fast, too slow. Uh, okay, preach for 15 minutes, okay. And, uh, and oh, don't be praying in tongues while people are up. We're so smart, we think that we can manage the power and the mighty omnipotence of God. Who do we think we are? If you're going to let God be God in your life, then how can you tell him what to do? But we do it. 
Well, God, I'm going to give you 10 minutes in the morning before I go to work, but you better bless me because I'm not going to be able to get back on my routine until, uh, let's see, three Saturdays. For, uh, okay, well, it's, But we expect God to show up when we got problems. We expect God to show up when we're in trouble. We expect God to roll the stone back when we're in a tomb. But yet we don't want to give him what belongs to him. We don't want to reverence the presence of God and come before him like we're supposed to in humility. All of our strength comes from intimacy. All of our strength comes from relationship with God. If your strength is coming from you, it's going to go. If your strength or what you're relying on for your support in life is your wallet, you're going to be broke. If you're relying on your spouse, God's going to take her away. If you're relying on your kids, God's going to take them away. Why? Because he wants to be your source. He said, I'll be first. I'll be second to none. You can't get this right. I'll take everything away until you fall down on your face and recognize that I am God all by myself and I don't need your help. And it's horrible that what it takes for us to recognize that sometimes is very painful, isn't it? Sometimes we get complacent in our worship and become selective in our obedience to God. Anybody ever been, you ever seen anybody like that? They're selective on what, on what commandments they want to obey and which ones they don't. Well, I can't do that. <laughs> I, I can't quit doing that, Pastor. Don't you know? I got to go see so-and-so. It's, it's just a drink. Mm. I'll behave. Which then leads to cutting corners in our worship and reverence of God. So we tend to cut corners because it's faster or easier. Cut corners because we don't want people to get impatient or, or be mad or be angry. Who cares what they think? Should we rather please God or please man? Is your feelings really worth walking away from what God has ordained for your life. Would you much rather have a man tell you what you want to hear or tell you what you need to hear? Would you much rather have somebody come up in your garbage and say you need to separate from this or it will keep you from what God has ordained for you? I guarantee you it will hurt your feelings at first. But then if you listen, It'll take you places you never thought you could go. You'll do things that you never thought you could do. God will show up. God will show up and show off in your life. And we're living in a time in this world where you better be close to our Savior. This is a time, man, I can't go there. I can't go there. The world we live in is great, isn't it? You think because you live in the United States that we're American Christians, right? <laughs> Whew. Worship was designed to be personal. It was never designed, the, the ark of God was never designed to be hauled on a cart by oxen. It was designed to be personal. It was supposed to be on the backs of men who had been consecrated to God. Mighty men of God who were consecrated. Does anybody know what consecrated means? It's not popular doctrine and it ain't taught very much today. Consecrated. It means they put everything out of their life that did not line up with the word of Almighty God. That ain't popular. People don't want to hear it, but that's okay. So it, it was a group of men who had decided to walk in the words of God who carried on their backs the presence and the spirit of Almighty God. But you say, well, that's kind of hard. Nobody's perfect. That's right. 
But you can walk in obedience to the word of God. Even though you make mistakes, you get back up and you keep walking in obedience, right? We don't make excuses. We make excuses for the way we live, for our lifestyle, right? The men who were consecrated were replaced by a more efficient machine. <laughs> True worship in our churches today is being replaced by a more efficient machine. True worship. Worship is not just 10 or 15 minutes at church on Sunday. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is a lifestyle, how you live your life. But it's being driven and changed by machines. Y'all think I'm crazy. That TV you watching, it's driving your life. That Facebook you're on is driving your life. That internet you're cruising is driving your life. It affects everything that you do. It is fatal to take charge of God. Uzzah decided he was going to take charge. Now, the Bible did not say that the cart fell. It said it shook. So Uzzah felt like he had to jump in there and save the day. How many times you've been working with somebody or dealing with somebody, and you've seen them about ready to fall down, and you want to run over there and save the day? You want to play God? Let me fall down. Let me fall down. Because if I hadn't have fallen down, God could have never raised me up. Let me fall down. Because listen, it was never designed for you to hold me up. It was never designed for you to hold God up. It was never designed for us to take charge of the presence of God like we own it. We don't own God. He owns us. You're not my people, you're his people. We belong to a creator who loves us very much, but he's also a creator of judgment and truth. We got to study the word. We got to figure out what the truth is, right? Did I lose anybody yet? Y'all ready to tell me out here? We tend to manage God into what is more convenient for us. Not you all, I'm just talking about in general, we cannot approach worship in terms of what's better for us, but rather what is preferable to God. Worship is, see this, and has your lifestyle become more about convenience rather than pleasing God? You have to love the word of God above the traditions of men. The traditions of men kind of drive our culture. And it's not because it's right or wrong, it's just because it's their traditions. We've, in a church culture, we've created traditions in our church that have nothing to do with God. And people would rather follow those traditions than listen and obey the word of God. What gives us the right to tell God what he needs to do? Well, God, you better show up. That's all we got is 15 minutes. Not you all. I know you all are. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 6 for me real quick. It's 2 Samuel 6, 6 and 7. And when they came to Nachon's threshing floor, Uzzah, this is the same event. It's taking place in a different text. It's a different explanation of it. Same, same event. And when they came to Jacob's uh, threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen had stumbled. I, I, I want to share something with you. Keep that scripture up there for me. And they came to Nachon's threshing floor. Anybody know what a threshing floor is? Threshing floor was a flat area, mostly paved or beaten down. 
made hard like concrete. They would bring the harvest in and they would throw the wheat on it and they would bring the cows in and the cattle and they would stomp all over it. Because all of that wheat had a hard outer shell that protected the fruit that was on the inside. And he had to break that chaff. It's called the chaff. He had to break that chaff out there, right? Can I go deeper? I go deeper? Sometimes when we get born again and we come into a relationship with God, we go through some stuff, and, and then we start to form this shell on ourselves because we don't want people to see our vulnerable underbelly and know that we're weak and know that we have struggles. So we form this shell, right? And, and, and this shell kind of protects us, right? Because that's what it does for the wheat. That, that shell protects the wheat until it's harvest time. You know, so they stomp and they get it out. But in our lives, and God brings us to the threshing floor so he can break that shell so that what he's doing on the inside of you can come forth. That's the fruit of God, right? So he raises us up. That's why they said in the New Testament, it says, let the wheat and the chafe come up together and we'll, we'll separate them at the end, right? Yeah, all of it's coming up in you. All of it's still there. But God will bring you to the threshing floor. When you begin to take God for granted and you get complacent in your walk with God, I don't think it's a coincidence that this stumbled and all this event took place at the threshing floor because when you take God for granted, he'll bring you back to the threshing floor to break you and to chastise you and to break open what callous. Uh, you, come on. You walk with God for any period of time, you're going to get callous. People are going to hurt your feelings. And you're going to walk around like ain't nothing wrong, smiling and happy, knowing on the inside you are mad. Knowing you got stuff inside of you that you need to give to God, but you're too angry and you're too holy to tell anybody else. But you will walk around with it and let it pollute your heart. And come on, if you don't have a pure heart, it will separate you and keep you from relationship and the presence of Almighty God. Man, y'all too quiet for me. You're just taking it in. <laughs> I ain't there yet. I ain't there yet. Stay right there. Uh, verse 7. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error. This word error, when it's translated, it was translated error, but the correct translation in the Greek and Hebrew is irreverent. Irreverent. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his irreverence. And he died there by the ark of God. Our irreverence of the presence and omnipotence and all them words I can't say. <laughs> if we don't reverence God, he will cut you off and bring you to the threshing floor so that he can break some of that chaff off of you to get you back. Because his purposes for us and his promises for us are always yes and amen, right? So if it's going to be yes and amen, that means he's got to get some stuff out of you or get some stuff off of you. So he's going to keep bringing us back to the threshing floor, and it's at the threshing floor. You, let me show you. You ever felt like you were going through a time period or a season in your life where everybody was just stomping all over you? No? Come on, man, I lived there for a while. I just felt like this devil just having a field day on me. He was just kicking back, you know. I thought he had the Holy Ghost. He was stomping all over me. But really, it was not his time. That was God's time. That was God's time. Um, you go back to Joseph. When Joseph finally revealed himself to his brothers after they had sold him into slavery and all that, he says... He told him, he said, don't worry, 
because you sold me into slavery, but God sent me. Might have been my mistakes that caused what happened to me to happen, but it was God who sent me. Oh, my. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, okay. Jonah. Jonah was in rebellion against God. He was going opposite to where God had told him. He was on the boat. All the men, everything going crazy. God was about ready to destroy the boat. He said, what do we do? He said, throw me over. They were like, what? He said, throw me over. They throw him over, and the storm went away. But what people failed to see is that the next thing that happened, the Bible says that everyone that was on that ship gave glory to the God of heaven and got saved. Even in his rebellion, even in his worst moments, God saved everybody around him when he was in his rebellion. He'll use your life no matter what. You think you something. You think you've got the lock on God. You think you know how God's going to save somebody. You know what they need more than God does. Come on, man. we got to get a grip. God will use your worst moments to do his best work. God will take your worst time. Oh, my. He'll take your biggest test and turn it into a testimony, right? That's good stuff, ain't it? The threshing floor was a time of harvest. So when they got to this threshing floor, when we, you know, start to take the presence of God for granted and he brings us back to the threshing floor, it's a time of harvest. He's not chomping all over you to break you up. He's chomping all over you because he wants to get the fruit out. He said, I want to see that fruit that I've been developing on the inside of you manifest on the outside of you because I'm tired of you looking like you used to and I want you to look like I want you to. It's time you start looking like the way I have ordained you to walk and looking like the way I've ordained you to look and talking like I have ordained you to talk. But we get so tied up in our own ways, right? We're going to control God. Well, I know what they need. Mm. Got me in trouble every time. I know what they need, all right. They need God. We tend to be callous by the things that happen to us. Why? Because we're offended. Nah, nah. Didn't get no amens on that one. We get offended too easy. We really do. Mighty man of God, offended because somebody didn't like your shoes. <laughs> Mighty man of God, man, because he didn't get to sit in his seat. Mighty man of God, offended because she didn't say hello to me. I know that was you. I know that was you in that car. You didn't wave at me. I'm mad at you. Come on. I don't know what wrong church folks sometimes. I was like, it wasn't me. It was an imposter. Oh. So, how are we supposed to act? How are we supposed to be? So we don't want to be like Uzzah, right? Because Uzzah had taken God for granted and taken the presence of God for granted. So then now I want to talk about somebody else. His name is Obed-Edom. Anybody ever had a, heard of Obed-Edom? I would smack my mother if she ever named me Obed Edom. I'll tell you right now. Could you imagine around going around telling her, my name's Obed Edom? Oh my goodness. I'd be mad. Do you feel dry? Do you feel like you, you no longer serve God out of passion, but now you've moved into a pattern of control and convenience? Maybe it's time we should look a little more like. Obed-Edom instead of like Uzzah. Okay, so they did all this in this event to bring the Ark of the Covenant to the city because David just had to have the Ark in the city because David knew without the presence of God, you've got nothing anyway, so we might as well go get it. But David screwed up because David took a bunch of guys with him to go get the Ark, and it says he bought a new cart. Oh, my goodness. Everybody wants to try something new. Everybody's got the next Jesus thing, right? Jesus don't need fixed. He doesn't need changed. He's already perfect. He's, 
He's God. He's sovereign all by himself. But we want to change God, right? We want to lead God around by the hand like he needs our help. So let's look at Obed-Edom. He's a Gittite. Anybody know who Gittites were? The 600 men who had left Gath with King David, they started, that's where they formed a colony, and they were called the Gittites. And it was the men who left, who left Gath and followed King David. And they were, they probably had knowledge of God. Bible doesn't say. He had to have some kind of knowledge of God. I don't think he had intimacy, but I don't think he had, I think he had a, a knowledge of God because think about it. If you just saw somebody die for touching the ark, you going to let them bring it in your house? Right? So he had to have some kind of knowledge uh, of God, whether he had intimacy, I don't know. But they brought the Ark of the Covenant to his house because it was right there. And because David got scared. He said, oh, my goodness. What have we done? Stick it over there. <laughs> oh, man, Edom probably like, what? Man, you just killed Uzzah. Don't bring it over here. But he did. He brought the, they, they brought the Ark into Obed Edom's house, and it stayed there for three months. And it changed Obed Edom's life. For three months, the presence of God. Could you imagine? Okay. I know your house is holy and anointed, but if the presence of God fell down in your house and stayed there for three months, you'd never get off your knees. Oh, come on. Come on. We'd never. Oh, oh, I couldn't go to work. Ah, come on. If the presence of Almighty God fell into your house. I mean, I know you think you're holy, but I'm talking about the divine presence of God fell into your house. I ain't got time for work, y'all. I got the, whoa! I got the Holy Ghost here now. Right, so, so here O.B. Beatum was three months with the presence of Almighty God in his house. And then they come up. King David said, man, I got it right now. I'm going to do it right now. Come on, we're taking it back to the city. <gasps> now, in them three months, God had blessed everything that Obed Edom had. Not only him, his stuff, his children, his family. Man, his wife done had like six, seven, eight sons. She was raising a football team. Anyway, so she was happy. Ah, but so Obed, <laughs> that was too far. So Obed, you know, he, gets, he gets all upset. He's like, wait a minute. You can't take the presence of God from me now. Think about, and just, just close your eyes and think about it with me for a second. How would you feel if you could never feel the presence of God again? First of all, I'm going to tear your arm off if you touch that ark. <laughs> so Obed-Edom had to make a decision because he didn't have a choice. King David was there to get it, and he was going to get it the right way this time. So Obed-Edom, he decided he uprooted his family he took everything he had and packed it up. He says, if the presence of God goes, I'm going with it. Yeah. He moved himself right on up to the city, right? And that wasn't good enough. Hobed Edom, he was done. He was, he was sold. He was done. He said, wait, let me do something. Let me, let me work at the gate. Let me work at the gate. Can't sing worth a lick. Ah, can let me sing. They made him a music minister. <laughs> He became the chief musician, and Obed-Edom didn't care. The Bible says that he worked his way up because God promoted him, because he pursued God without caution. He didn't care what it took. He said, I don't care if I got to move my family. I don't care what I got to do, but I cannot be without the presence of God in my life. By the time it was all said and done, this man was working in the presence of God for God. Mm. So, what are you afraid to let go of that's keeping you from the presence of God? What are you afraid to stop doing? What are you afraid to let go of? Who is keeping you from the presence of God in your life? You better run. You better run. Figure out what it is and eliminate it. 
Figure out who it is and run the other direction. Figure out what they got that you need in your life and call on God for it. Because what they got is a fake imitation. What God's got is the real thing. This ain't a joke. This ain't a joke. Obed-Edom didn't take this lightly. He said, oh, no, you ain't taking the presence of God from me. I'll follow the God wherever he goes. He said, uh, he didn't care. Let me wash the toilets. Let me clean the, but how many is willing to? Because we, like I said earlier, we tend to pick and choose what stuff we want to give up and what stuff we want to hold on to, which commandments we want to follow and which commandments we want to twist according to our own lifestyle. Nope, that didn't hurt anybody, did it? You ain't got to say amen because I know. I got you. How many times not only Obed-Edom was blessed, but his children were blessed, his family. It says, the Bible says that his heritage was his family his sons, his grandsons, they all worshiped the Lord. They were all blessed. They were all leaders. And matter of fact, they were in charge of the storehouse. I don't know about you, but I'd be walking around like a peacock. <laughs> Come on, Obed, Obed Edom, his sons and his grandsons. I mean, that'll make you stand up tall, right? You want that for your kids, for your family? So what did Obed eat him? What, what was it that he had? It was because of, number one, his faith. Number two, his attitude. How many know we've got to be careful about our attitude? Your attitude when you walk through your life. Obed eat him. He had the right attitude. He wasn't worried about nobody else around him. He wasn't worried about what Joe, 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 Tom, and Sally was doing. All he cared about was getting in the presence of God. His attitude was, whatever, y'all do whatever, but I got to be in the presence of God. Where everybody else had taken the presence of God for granted because they'd been in the presence of God for so long, Obed-Edom didn't know what it was like, so he got a taste of it. He said, oh, no. And do you think Obed-Edom reverenced God? He had so much reverence for God, he didn't care where he had to serve. He said, I don't care if I have to serve in the parking lot. I don't care if I have to clean the toilets. I don't care if I have to vacuum the floors. I don't care if I work in Kirk Kids Ministry. I don't care where I serve. I just got to be in the presence of Almighty God. Willing to do whatever it took to get in the presence of God, right? And because of his attitude, God blessed him. And then he had something else that most of us don't have. You might have faith, you might have the right attitude, but then he had action. He had action. He didn't sit around and talk about it. Oh, my goodness. I, said, I hear him all the time. They say, oh, man, I'm just waiting on God. God's going to do this with my life. God's going to do that with my life. Oh, I know. He told me he's going to do this. What you waiting on, fool? <laughs> well, I'm waiting on God. Man, you crazy. Obed-Edom didn't wait on God to say nothing. He said, I'm going. I said, I'm doing this thing. He didn't wait on, he wasn't waiting on nobody. He didn't care. He said, I don't care. I just got to be in the presence of God. I can't live without him. Until you get to a place where you can't live without God. Until you can't be without the presence of almighty God. Your attitude's not going to change. Your perception won't change. Your heart won't change. But in order to get there, so, so, so how do we get there? Because I know there's some here today, man, you've been walking with the Lord a long time, but you're feeling like you kind of lost touch. You lost your fire. You lost your passion. Or maybe you don't have that anxious feeling anymore about coming into the presence of God. Or maybe you've never experienced the presence of God. Maybe you don't know what that's like. So how do you get there? I'm going to give you three things. I'm going to give you three things. 
How am I doing? I got, I got, I got, I got six minutes? Okay. Number one. <laughs> I promise you, I'll try and work it out in three minutes. Number one, keep a pure heart. Unconfessed sin is a relationship and blessing stopper with God. Keep a pure heart. You do something wrong, confess it. You hurt somebody, run to them. I'm sorry, immediately. Don't wait about it. Don't give yourself time to think about it because if I give my time to think about it, I ain't going back. I'm done. A polluted heart will get you nowhere. You have to protect your heart. The Bible says for it affects everything that you do. You hurt somebody or somebody hurts you, go to them. Make it right. It ain't worth it. You say, well, they don't deserve it. Oh, so you don't want to be in the presence of God then. So your feelings is worth more than being in the presence. And I don't understand people. I don't get it. Come on. Number two, study the word of God and meditate on it daily. People say, well, well I don't understand this meditate thing. I say, hmm, nope, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> How many people in here worry? How many people in here worry? Come on, you got to be real with me now. You know how to worry, right? If you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. You know how that worry is. That worry be on your mind. You be replaying it all in your mind. Like, oh my God. <laughs> when you meditate on the word of God, meditate on it in your mind. Meditate on the word of God, the good things of God, as he's called us to. If you can worry, you can meditate. You pick you a scripture and you meditate on it until it makes you, until it brings peace in your life or until it brings you to a place where you can receive from God. Right? If you can worry, you can meditate. I see people do all kinds of things. That's not what I'm talking about. Man. You got to study the word of God. And meditate on it daily. Number three. You ready? Relax and rest in the peace of God. We always think we got to be busy doing something. Oh, I got to be doing something. I do, 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 do. Man, just sit back and rest and know that God is God. He's God all by himself. He don't need you running around like a chicken with your head cut off. I promise you, you will not get any more done. Because God is perfect in all of his ways, right? So you're only going to get as much done as he called you to. But how much do you want to wear yourself out? I learned it by accident. You will wear yourself out doing the same thing that God could have done if you would have just sat back and relaxed. Right? Number, number four, final thing. Look, I made it. Got four minutes left. You ready? Get up and move. Do it. Get up and move. Go after the presence of God. What are you waiting on? It takes action. Obed Edom showed us. Man, go ahead. Where's the music? Music. Musicians? Something. No, but on a serious note, I know there's somebody here today. Maybe you, you feel dry. Maybe you've never experienced the presence of Almighty God. Maybe you walked with God to such a degree it was amazing, and now all of a sudden you don't know quite what's going on. Our God is faithful, and He loves us. He calls us back to the threshing floor. The threshing floor is where he begins to tear off the chaff. He begins to separate those things out of your life that he does not want in them because they are keeping you from his promise, not bringing you to his promise. I know that we like to joke around and we like to have a good time, but I know there's people in here who have never experienced the intimacy with God that he wants to call you into. God is so good. 
He'll fix everything in your life. All the strength you need will come from relationship with Him. We think that we need people in our lives, but all we need is God. His purpose for you, everybody says, well, I don't know what my purpose is. Your purpose was designed to worship God. So today I call on you to check your worship. Check your worship. Not the songs you sing, but your lifestyle. Because worship's not about the songs you sing. Worship is about intimacy with the one true God, the creator of all things, the one who loved you so much that he hung up on a cross and said, I got you. Even though you can, I can. His purpose for us is never to destroy us. It's to separate all the things off of you that are going to keep you from his destiny for you. Would you stand with me today? If there's anybody here today who needs prayer, who maybe you have never experienced that, that presence of God, Maybe you've lost the presence of God. Or maybe you want a closer, deeper walk with God. Uh, we have people that will pray with you. The altars are open. But I'm going to pray for you right now. Yes, by all means, come down. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what's happening in your life. But God wants to take you deeper. God wants to draw you closer to Him. His glory is here right now. The presence of God is in the house. Come on up. Come on up. That's not everybody. Come on up. God sent me here for a reason. I'm not here for me. I'm here for him. I'm here for you. What do you need? Whatever you need, God's got. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much. Father, we thank you for your spirit that now dwells within us. Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would invade each and every one of our lives here today. Father, I pray that you do a new thing. Put a fiery coal in our bellies that we might seek you and serve you with all that we are and all that we have. Father, we pray that you give us strength to set down the things that are keeping us from that relationship with you that we know we're supposed to have. Father, we never fail to give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus Christ's holy name I pray. And everybody said...